Indeluizi, Gunik Sis, No J Yahweh, Banawebskik, Gunik Nidudem. My spirit name is Little Otter from Penobscot Otter Clan. And I do a lot of speaking, and today is going to be a little bit different because I'm speaking from a very personal place in my, my journey and my um, personal birthing story of my daughter, who's now just turned one. And uh, so I come from a, a more vulnerable place, I'm not used to sharing such personal um, knowledge in um, my journey, but I think it's really important because my personal journey is one of, I think all of my generation and all of us at this time as indigenous people uh, reclaiming uh, what our ancestors have left behind for us, uh, the bundles that they've left behind for us to pick up and gather at this time to uh, practice again in safety and in love and ensuring that our, our children are able to do the same. I want to start with really where it began for me, <clears throat> and that is when I got my first, um, my first moon time. So when I forgot my first menstrual cycle for the first time, uh, my mother said to me, and I'll always remember this pretty clearly, we're in the living room. She said, there's a ceremony you're supposed to do at this time, but I don't know the ceremony you're supposed to have. She said, she explained to me, so I'm Penobscot and we're Wabanaki people, we're people of the dawn. And so we come here from the Northeast where the sun rises. So we are the people who greet that sunrise every day. And it said as Wabanaki people, we greet that sun so that sun will cast forth on the rest of Turtle Island. And so it is our duty as Wabanaki people uh, to greet that sun every day. And that is part of our work. But it was at this time at my first moon that my mom told me of the seventh fire prophecy. And she said, long time ago, there was uh, prophecies that um, the newcomers were coming and there was going to be a lot of turmoil and that the vision was had that the people had to move, um, move westward to where the food grows on water. And so there was a lot of councils and a lot of things happening, um, but that's what happened. The Wabanaki people, we consist of a few nations, but we're all, we're all related. We're all cousins based on where we, where we reside. So I'm Banawebskik, the people of the White Rocks, but also Wabanaki or Passamaquoddy people, Maliseet people, Mi'kmaq people, Abenaki, I'm also Abenaki. Um, so we're all Wabanaki people, but what happened at this time before the newcomers came is the Ojibwe nation used to reside with us and we all were Wabanaki. And we had these prophecies that the Ojibwe <clears throat> were to take our sacred bundles, our sacred ceremonies, our sacred knowledge and take it west to protect it, to guide it because the newcomers were coming from the east on the ocean. And so they were to move west and they would know where they needed to reside, where the food grew on water. And so my mother said at this time, the Madewin, when they took that bundle and they know the ceremony you're supposed to have at this time. And uh, maybe at some point in your life, you can find that knowledge, you can find that information again. And so that always sat with me, you know? So I, I knew I was missing some pieces. And um, I knew, my mom taught me though that our menstrual cycle was powerful. She taught me the teachings that she knew about our moon time. She taught me our connection to the moon. She taught me the connection of the moon to the water, how our womb holds, holds that water, how it connects us. So she did have all of those teachings, but what we were missing was that in-depth rite of passage, that in-depth um, rite of passage ceremony. Um, but she provided me with what she knew. And um, my mom had me at home she had my son at home, you know, she carried us in cradle boards. So she had that knowledge and, you know, our grandmothers um, all had our babies at home. Um, her, she was born in the hospital, the only generation. 
Um, but she was already part of that reclamation, having me again at home, carrying us in cradle boards, because it was really my, my, my grandmother's generation that had the, um, the, the disconnect, the trauma, the, um, you know, the policing and the not being able to practice our ceremonies and um, birthing the way we did and using our medicines. But my mom had already started that process of, um, you know, knowing our birthrights, knowing our, our power. And, um, she, you know, she told me stories about, you know, how my, my grandmother, you know, was born on the res with no running water. And I always, you know, asked um, um, her generation, you know, that generation about birthing and who, who was helping who and how all the aunties and the grandmothers would come to just deliver the baby and that knowledge, how it was just, it was just a skill as any other, just as medicine knowledge, just as hunting, um, just as fishing, um, birthing was just the knowledge that the women kept. And so these are, these are things I always knew. And, you know, deep down, um, <clears throat> when uh, I also at the time, becoming into my teen years, um, spent a lot of times in the woods getting to know the plants and my relatives, our relatives there, um, introducing myself, getting to know their names. I really wanted to know how my ancestors survived in the Northeast here, our plants, our medicines, what we ate, how we survived. So um, I went right, I studied herbal medicine and as a senior in college. And um, I uh, asked my um, teacher how I could do, be an herbalist for a living. You know, I just wanted, I just love the plants so much. And now in retrospect, I realize, you know, it was the plants and the ancestors who were actually guiding me the whole time. But that's what brought me to naturopathic medicine. It wasn't, you know, wanting to be a doctor. It was just my love of plant medicine, my love of nature, knowing that nature could cure us knowing that that was, for me at the time, um, studying ethnobotany in college and then going on to get my naturopathic degree, it was just the only feasible way I had to really gain more and more knowledge of medicine. And that's really, you know, it was really more just me wanting to know for my own family, how to help my family. I knew at the time I was going to have children. I always knew I wanted children. So how was I going to take care of my children like my ancestors did? Um, my mom, I said, I wanted to be a midwife. And she said, no, that's too hard. <laughs> They're always on call. They don't get any sleep. And um, so she kind of strayed me away from midwifery school. I probably would have went to midwifery school. Um, so, you know, I started my practice and it was many years later, actually. I was into my 30s. Um, I had already had my son. And um, the, the Medewin was, um, I was off a path a little bit, and um, the, there was a Medewin woman, Doreen Day, she, um, my son's grandmother, Carol Dana, brought her to Indian Island to teach. And I was like, oh look, it's a Medewin midwife, Ojibwe, and I knew I needed to go, so I drew, drove, I think six hours to go to her talk, and um, really wanted to connect with her. And um, I saw, a little while later, after connecting with her, <clears throat> that Millicent um, Simenson in uh, Minnesota was having indigenous midwifery teachings, and Doreen was going to be one of the teachers. And I saw that it had um, Medewin as the, the foundation. And so I called Millie up, and I'm like, you know, I'm coming from all this way. Is it worth it? She said, get, you get over here. You need to be here. And it wasn't till... I'm not sure when it was exactly, but at some point I realized it's actually, we're living out the seventh fire right now. So that seventh fire prophecy had um, seven fires. And so in that was the, um, the migration. So the first fire, the second fire, part of it was the migration. But I didn't realize that um, we're actually living out the seventh fire right now. And in that seventh fire, it says the children, the new, the new children are going to need to go finding that information again. They said in the prophecy that we need to go searching for that knowledge, that we're probably going to have to travel far to find it, and that we're going to have to wake up those elders to make sure they can teach us. And some of the elders will be sleeping, 
um, but that we have to be persistent in bringing that knowledge back. And so here I am, I've been, I was traveling to Minnesota. We, um, every, for two years, um, we had four day ceremonies with a group of women studying midwifery in our um, traditions, our um, spiritual traditions around birthing. And that's really kind of where the wheel started spinning. It's like once you get on the path, there's no jumping off. It's just uh, it's just forward and and then and, and then it's like the wheels start spinning. And so it's just more and more, and that bundle just grew and grew and grew. Um, we had really Anna Gibbs, I just want to say she was uh, also an um Red Lake um the day when elder um who's passed on, um, but just really grateful for those for those teachings that were shared with us and the power of that group and that, that woman's circle of getting together in ceremony for four days, four times a year, for two years, to really get together and talk about every single piece of, med of uh, midwifery, sharing the plant medicine, the knowledge. And so it was with that and those prayers, I always wanted a little girl and um, I was a single mom and um, so my prayers started to get bigger and bigger. And it was at that time that um, I come to find out about this rite of passage, this moon time ceremony. And I found out that um, they were putting grandmothers on because I wasn't the only one that didn't have this ceremony. So there was a lot of women who didn't have the opportunity to have that first moon rite of passage ceremony. And so they were doing honorary fasts for women of my age who even, who've already had children, even grandmothers were being allowed to go onto the ceremony. And so there was three of us in our group, two other Cree women and myself, who did this honorary berry fast. And it was in that time where <laughs> it really, it really got deep. The power of our moon, fertility, um, the connection to the moon, to connection to the berries, our connection to the land, our connection to the water, our water prayers. Um, that's when it really um, was really getting deep. Yes, a berry fast. Um, so many teachings, um, so much prayers. It's a year long. So in that year long, now that I had another child after I realized that's to prepare for your year long ceremony of when you're, when you're pregnant, that's your year long ceremony to acknowledge your moon, to um, deepen those relations, those connections, to honor that fertility. And that is actually where your prenatal care starts. And so your prenatal care actually starts with that rite of passage ceremony. And even, even just kind of reviewing it for this talk, kind of the depth of it, I, I can't articulate the depth of it. It's something that really needs to be experienced. And those grandmother sharing, those grandmother teachings, um, it's, it's really profound, so much that I can't really articulate. Well, what I've come to realize was that that rite of passage, that ceremony when you first get your first moon, that very fast is what prepares you for your prenatal, the whole preparation for motherhood begins there. Um, and then once you recognize the, on, the honor and the blessing of that moon and you work with that fertility, um, then you're able to recognize and honor pregnancy and then labor. And so labor, it won't be something to fear. Your moon time won't be something to hold and disregard or disgust. It's gonna be the most powerful thing we have as women. And so it's, it's really about embracing, embracing that power and that strength. <clears throat> so that year long ceremony was really a culmination for me. Um, it really was the pathway forward for me um, receiving my daughter. Um, a lot of other things um, transpired after that, just more and more ceremonies and more and more depth. Um, but through that time, I was always praying for this little girl. Um, in my family, I come from a long line of Penobscot women. 
and I really wanted that um, lineage to move forward. And I have a beautiful son, but I was really praying for a woman to pass that lineage on to carry forth my, um, you know, the Penob the strong Penobscot women that we have. And um, my son even gave me, I, I should have sh brought it to show to you, but it's his beautiful grandfather, this beautiful rock, and it's a womb with a baby on it. And uh, my son said, Mom, here you can pray with this grandfather for your baby. So I would um, put my prayers out. And, you know, my child was definitely a gift from the creator. Was She was definitely, um, I'm not going to get into... Um, the, the night of conception or the night of um, conception, but you know, I'm, I'm, I was 39 and you know, people say fertility decreases as you age, but really that's not the case when you take care of yourself. And um, infertility is such a big issue these days that more and more people are becoming infertile. And I think as indigenous people, we need to start from the beginning and that's honoring our moon time, taking care of ourselves and our, and our vessel. Um, but anyway, you know, the, I could feel when conception happened, I was in a safe place and I could feel that spirit come in. And so that spirit, that spirit came into my womb and, um, I knew then, you know, that it happened and it happened in a ceremony in a spiritual way as well. And so to honor that and to, and to create that safe place so that spirit feels um, comfortable and safe coming into this life. So, <clears throat> so that's really, and then, and then the ceremony just gets deeper and deeper. So, um, a week later, we were having a healing of a turtle, healing the wounds of Turtle Island ceremony at home, this place called Nabizin and past the Dumkeg. So it's in um, Penobscot territory. And let's see, there was, not last year, but the year before when, when, I, when I was pregnant. And um, I had just missed my moon and I had felt the conception, you know, a week or two earlier and I had missed my moon and I hadn't told anybody I was carrying a child yet. And, uh, but I knew because, you know, I had already known and my cycle, I, I was late now a couple of days. And so uh, here we are at the ceremony and um, there was multiple events happening, different ceremonies throughout. And Patricia Gonzalez, the first presenter on your podcast, Rhonda, she was leading the ceremony there to honor children. And so she was having a ceremony to honor children. And she asked all the children to come to the center. And I said, oh, I'm carrying a baby, but nobody knows yet. And, you know, if I go to the center, my mom will know already and the word will be out. So I went up after the ceremony was dispersing a little bit and Patricia did a blessing for me on my child. And I thought, wow, you know, how spectacular, how special, because this baby just got conceived and now I'm already receiving this blessing from this beautiful midwife. And so that really, it just, you know, the ceremony for my child and this gift that I had been praying for um, was just beginning and just um, developing. And that's what happens when you live this life and you put out your tobacco and you make your offerings, all the beauty um, just comes and, pre and presents itself. And so I really acknowledge um, Patricia for that, um, for setting the stage for my ceremonial, um, um, my, my ceremonial birth, my ceremonial um, time. And um, at that time, I said, you know, I'm pregnant. Well, I told her because she did the ceremony for me. And she said, you know, you should really get my book. And I don't have time to read books. I have a son. I have, um, you know, a medical practice. But when I when I was pregnant, it was I was so introverted. I had just so much time for myself that I read her book, and that book set the stage for my ceremony. Every time you open that those pages in her her book, um, Red Red Medicine, it's like the ceremony and. Um, and I also read um, Sherry Mitchell's book, Sacred Instructions. So that's part of the teachings of pregnancy, taking care of yourself, nurturing yourself, feeding your body good foods, but also feeding your mind and feeling your, feeding your spirit. So it's really all about that holism, feeding your body, feeding your mind, feeding your spirit. And so that's what my nine months was really dedicated to. 
you know, I was taking the time for myself. I was, um, I was really protecting myself. In my pregnancy, my father passed away. Um, he was older in age, and um, I was told by my, um, my daughter's father to put some black ash from the fire on my forehead, and that was to protect the baby. Because when that in that realm of um, the spirit transitioning out of this world, and then also trying to bring that spirit into this world, we need to protect our baby um, so that they don't the so that they don't leave. We didn't. I didn't want my child spirit to leave with my father, because the, she's not really here yet, and he was just leaving. So I didn't want her spirit to leave with him. So. Had it not been my father, I would have not probably not have gone to the funeral and I would have stayed away to protect myself. And those are a lot of the teachings um, that were passed down. But I put that black ash on my um, forehead. That's what I was told to do to protect the baby so that her spirit wouldn't leave. So these are the ways um, that we were I was really taking care of myself. Um, part of that time, too, I was going to Canada. <clears throat> um, to Kathy Bird's um, plant medicine camps. And I was, you know, in my first trimester and at her camps, it's really beautiful because she has all traditional foods. And um, musk muskrat is um, one of our really special traditional foods. And I actually never had muskrat. And um, I don't know if you've ever seen it cooked, but it's kind of um, freaky. It's, you know, got its tail and its teeth and it's, you know, and they cook it in its like whole form. And, um, you know, when you're in your first trimester, you're a little queasy. <clears throat> so I was like, you know, I'm not going to have any, you know, thanks. Um, and there was this Cree woman there, Rose, really special woman, really special friend. And she said, you know, you really should eat that muskrat. And I was like, oh, you know, I think I'll pass. And she goes, no, you really need to eat it because that muskrat eats all the medicine and your baby is going to get that medicine and your child needs that medicine. And that's how we know the muskrat um, is that that muskrat eats the muskrat root. It's a really powerful Penobscot medicine. And so I said, you know, you're right. I, I, should, I need to eat these traditional foods, especially this muskrat here because then my child will get this medicine, have this taste for our traditional foods. So even in pregnancy, those type of things are important. And I was really grateful to her for really taking the time to make sure that I was, um, I was doing that for my child. And so that was um, really special. And uh, Rose, that Cree woman is such a beautiful woman. She also sent me a whole PowerPoint on moss bags and I'll show you my moss bag that I made. Um, but she sent me, you know, and we had the teachings of the moss bag too. And the, it's really special those Cree women carry um, those teachings so powerfully of that moss bag. And I just really want to um, also, you know, send gratitude for her for, you know, taking the time to really make sure that I had that knowledge and I was ready to um, put it into practice. So part of this whole time, all of these years, you know, I've just been, you know, picking up this bundle, picking up the medicine knowledge, um, picking up these traditions, these teachings. And it was really, you know, almost for selfish reasons, you know, so I knew how to take care of my children, how, so I knew how to help my family. But it's also, you know, to help, help our community and bring those teachings back home. And that's part of that seventh fire prophecy. <clears throat> but in also in taking care of myself, so, you know, I, I did all my own prenatal care. Um, you know, I didn't have an ultrasound. I didn't want any medicalization of birth. You know, I knew I wasn't diabetic. I knew my diet is really healthy. You know, I tend to eat all organic as it is. Um, I knew I didn't have high blood pressure. I didn't have any illnesses. In fact, being 39, I said, you know, I have to stay clear because they'll put me right automatically. They'll put me at a high risk category. And I'm like, you know, I can't, I'm like, I'm not high risk, you know, and leave me alone. That, that was just my main, um, 
my main emotion with pregnancy was just protecting, protecting me, protecting my space, protecting my baby, kind of like, you know, um, you know, if I need help, you know, I'll reach out. Um, so anyway, you know, but in my prenatal care, you know, I, I help a lot of women with prenatal care anyway, you know, in my practice, I do family medicine. And um, I actually was trained with a mid naturopathic midwife, Mary Bove, who's got a couple of children's medicine books, but I worked in her practice for many years, studied under her. Um, so I felt, I feel pretty comfortable anyway with prenatal care. Um, so I took a prenatal and I also took um, probiotics and, um, you know, it's actually something our ancestors didn't have to worry about, our uh, microbiome, um, because our soil health was so, so high, you know, um, I kind of laugh about, you know, the words like permaculture or, um, you know, um, growing multiple plants, because our ancestors had all of that, like, down, you know, we didn't dig into the earth, you know, we raised our, we raised the mounds, we added seaweeds and alewives, and so our minerals and the microbiome in our soil, you know, um, was always, always top notch. And now today, the degradation of our soil and the antibiotics and the pharmaceuticals, you know, our microbiomes, our own gut flora is completely devastated. And so I need to take a probiotic um, just for my own health. I know that. Um, but recently, I, I did a talk through for um, MANA. No, what was it for? Anyway, for somebody, um, Gold Midwifery. And it was on um, probiotics. But probiotics and prenatal care, it prevents gestational diabetes. It prevents blood pressure, prevents um, preeclampsia, prevents strep infections. Um, so I was just mind blown about how much prevention is just in our gut flora. So, you know, where people might be high risk for, you know, gestational diabetes or high blood pressure or strep infections, all of those potential risks, um, the, pre the probiotics prevent all of that. And then I also only took two herbal medicines and um, one was gifted to me. Um, and I didn't even tell her yet. So one of the Cree women who did the ceremony with me in her giveaway, she gifted me some red raspberry leaf. And I had that red raspberry leaf in a jar. I mean, she gifted that to me and um, I didn't use it until, you know, my pregnancy. And I, whenever I made that medicine, I knew that medicine was coming from a really sacred place. Um, that was her giveaway and her ceremony. And so I just wanna thank her too for that medicine. So I use that red raspberry tea. Um, and there's also so much research about how that red raspberry um, prevents um, prolonged labor, hemorrhage, um, you know, helps hold the, hold the pregnancy. Um, so that was really my only medicine besides, you know, taking care of myself. I think I took a fish oil too. Towards my third trimester, I did take a fish oil. So many of us are deficient in, um, you know, here in the Northeast, we had um, fought the dams for a really long time. And, um, and we're at a point now where we don't have any um, wild Atlantic salmon. Um, I'm probably unlike where you are, Rhonda. But um, so many of us are omega-3 deficient. And those omega-3s also prevent gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, high blood pressure, help the baby's brain develop. So if I, the supplements I took were the prenatal fish oil and probiotic, and then the red raspberry tea. Um, <clears throat> so that's what I did. And, you know, I didn't know what I was going to do as far as midwives. Um, I think um, Patricia said, oh, you should, because I wanted an indigenous midwife, and she recommended Rhonda. She's a traveling midwife. And then I met Rhonda that fall when I was pregnant. There was a group of indigenous midwives there. And I was like, you know, I don't have a midwife and I'm not sure what I'm gonna do. But I prayed on it and I was praying and praying, what am I gonna do? I have options. 
I'm not sure what, 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 what I want to do. And I had a dream. So my mom had a midwife. Her name was Miriam. And um, she delivered me and my brother. And she lives about an hour from me. And she's got an herbal company, uh, Wise Way Herbals. She's a really beautiful woman. And I had a dream that she said, oh, now when I'm delivering babies, I'm having a giveaway ceremony. And that was my dream. And when I woke up, I said, you know, I think she would be the right woman because um, she recognizes the need for ceremony and she recognized, and wow, that's a powerful thing. I must, maybe I should have a giveaway ceremony. I never knew about that. And um, so she came to me in that dream. And so I think I might've been seven, seven months pregnant. I called her and it's funny too, cause my mom's story, her pregnancy, she was like eight months pregnant and um, in the grocery store. And they said, oh, do you have a midwife? And my mom's like, no, I don't have a midwife. And she was like, oh, I know Miriam, you should have her be your midwife. So she didn't get her, my mom's story too, same as me. So I called Miriam and she delivered me. And I said, you know, I really want a hands off, um, I really want a hands off labor and delivery. And um, will, you, will you support me in that? And she said, yes, yep. And so just through connection and not really, you know, feeling the necessity, she actually didn't come to my home until a week before my due date. <laughs> and um, we had lunch, you know, she didn't even examine me. And, you know, I, and maybe I said, yo, check out the belly. And maybe she put her hands on my belly, but that was, you know, the extent of it. And we had lunch and we just went through a list of supplies, make sure I had all my supplies. Um, and, um, with those supplies, you know, um, I was prepared. So I had like, my mom had a retained placenta and hemorrhaged. And so I had a retained placenta formula. I had a hemorrhage formula, you know, so I had all my herbal formulas, um, sits bath herbal formulas. So I had, you know, everything prepared slowly gathering it together. Um, my son and I, I have a picture I'll show you of him and I. So I used a special medicine that I've never used before, um, the partridge berry. Um, some people get mad at me when I say squaw vine, but I only say it because that's another common name for it. And you know, squaw, they, they, they say is a, um, derogatory word that was used against us women. But esque is woman, esque. And to me, that is showing the deep connection that plant has for women going way back. And so I gathered that and I drank that tea in the, my last month to prepare for labor. And it was funny, um, so it was my first time really experiencing and using that medicine. Um, and I feel like more women should really um, get to know that medicine, get to know that plant. I mean, I always sat with the plant. You know, we have a long relationship, but I never actually um, used it personally. And so it was funny in my last month where I was starting to prepare, I was like, no, I'm not ready yet. I'm not ready to prepare yet. So I think I didn't start drinking it till maybe three weeks before my, my um, due date. I don't like to say due dates. Because, you know, I looked into it, only 5% of babies are actually come on the due date. So to me, it just mixes, it's too mixed, it mixes everything up. So I don't even like to look at that. But it was more of a, um, you know, I'm not ready to, because my whole pregnancy, I was nurturing, safety, and I didn't, I wasn't ready to transition over to prepare for labor mentality. Um, so when I was ready to transition over to prepare for labor, um, that's when I started to drink that medicine. And I just started, you know, one cup of medicine a day. I didn't really make it too strong, really, really gentle, really beautiful, gentle medicine. Um, and then I also had a ceremony. So, you know, I didn't want, you know, your typical um, baby shower, um, but I, I wanted a, prep, a preparation ceremony for myself. 
and I'll show you a picture. I don't have a picture of the ceremony itself, but it was really beautiful. Just my grandmother and my mom, and my aunts and my sister and some close friends. I had them gather and um, they gave me a cedar bath and sang for me and we all smudged. We all offered our tobacco prayers for a, a healthy birthing, healthy baby. You know, we honored the water and the strawberries. So I was able to really um, connect to creation and the gifts and to really um, honor and what was about to happen with bringing that baby forward. And I feel like those prayers, those tobacco prayers, the water prayers, the berry prayers, um, being with my family, cleansing myself, smudging, um, using the eagle fan, um, giving myself, or I didn't give myself, my sister, um, you know, gave me that bath, you know, that really helped to cleanse my space to prepare for my, um, my delivery. Um, I had made um, also part of that giveaway that the Cree woman in my ceremony, she also gifted me a cloth that was specific for the moss bag. She said, you know, in her giveaway, this is for the moss bag. And so I um, used her cloth that she gave me and I sewed that moss bag with all those moss bag teachings. I um, beaded um, a pouch for, for the umbilical cord um, my daughter goes on her father's clan, so she's bear clan, and so I um, beaded a bear, uh, a bear pout, bear claw, and um, for the umbilical cord, and the father made the cradle board. So part of our teachings is the father uh, makes that cradle board. Um, one of the things I was praying about was um, if I was going to have the baby in a birthing lodge. Um, but the father actually um, is from Red Lake and he was in Red Lake. And um, so I didn't have him there to build the lodge. So I was a little upset about that, but um, in retrospect, um, you know, where I gave birth on the living room floor, and, you know, that's just um, worked out fine. So um, I had all the, all the preparations in place. I had all my prayers all my ceremonies, um, everything ready. The cradle board, moss bag, the umbilical pouch, my herbal formulas. And so I was really ready. Um, baby was really getting into position. Um, I'll say she was a week late, but that's not really true. Um, and she just came when she was ready. And um, my son was, we were still, um, we were still um, co-sleeping <laughs> and uh, he was um, nine, still co-sleeping. And um, I went into labor and um, you know, my contractions were just real gradual. And so I just laid in bed with my contractions about midnight they started and um, the contractions were just getting more and more intense. So at 4 a.m. Um, I called my sister who was gonna do the drumming for me and she was my doula for my son. and. I called her and I said, I'm in labor, but I don't want you to come. <laughs> and then I called Mary, and my, the midwife, and I said, I'm in labor, but I don't want you to come. And then I sent my other friend a text who's a naturopath and a midwife. Just a heads up, I'm in labor, but I don't want you to come. So, um, you know, I just let the labor progress and then I changed bedrooms. And then at 4 a.m. it was like really getting intense. And I actually live with my mother. Um, so I woke my mom up and I said, you know, I'm in labor. And uh, so she woke up and um, that's when things got messy. So she was on cleanup duty, following me around with the mop um, because I clogged the toilet and then I vomited from that. So I was just really grateful to have her support for that, um, helping me in my cleanup. And it's so funny. So um, I had her make me a cup of tea and she was smudging the home. So she smudged the home and I was making my tea and um, my, uh, my contractions, I didn't realize it was transition because it was, you know, 12, probably about 6 a.m. Um, my mom had only been up for like an hour. So I pretty much labored on my own. And my son was just waking up to go to school. And I was like, you know, I don't know what position to get in to make this feel any better. And she said, you better get used to it. <laughs> you could be here for a while. So that was the extent of my, um, my um, support.
<laughs> so I, I had to literally shake her off. All right, what am I going to do? And that's when I really went internal. It was so intuition, you know, you know, what, you know, I couldn't even, I didn't even think. So the next contraction, I, oh, bared down really hard. And I you come to think of it, you know, if I was in a hospital or even with a midwife, they might have said, you know, don't push. You're not ready to push. They would have tried to control things or perhaps, you know, try to control and say, I need to check you first. You might not be ready. So I didn't, I didn't want any of that. So I just, <clears throat> and then my water broke. And I said, baby's coming. And I um, threw myself in the ground on all fours. So those two positions are just what I needed. It was just following my intuition. And I just went on all fours. And I said, mom, come catch the baby. And um, my mom kind of was like, oh, OK, you know. And so she come to catch the baby. And you know, she wanted to clean me a little bit. So she went to the kitchen for some paper towels. And so I'm there. And, um, you know, the baby's crowning and, you know, I'm trying to, um, I didn't want to tear. So I was thinking in my head, you know, I don't want to tear. So I'm just going to breathe through this and, you know, I'm feeling the baby and I'm like, you know what, I'm just going to push. <laughs> and, um, my mom came back and I pushed and her head came out. My mom said she was just looking at the baby in her hands and it was just the most beautiful thing of just you know, my mom holding that baby. And I'm like, mom, do you have her? Do you have her? And my mom wasn't saying a word, just looking at that baby. And then the next contraction is just slithered right out. And so my mom had her and then gave her right to me. And, um, you know, in retrospect, I realized so much about this, that, you know, my life, I was working towards being able to deliver my own grandchildren the way our ancestors did. But my mom needed to be a part of that um, healing too. And my mom may not have um, initiated that per se, but it was only with her, um, her, her knowing that, that delivery and pregnancy is natural and powerful and her knowing that, oh, you just need to do it. You just, you know, She's always been like that. Oh, that's just what you have to do. You know, you better get used to it. You just got to push this baby out. And so it was with her knowledge, with her strength, um, with my mom's power that I had that power. She passed that on to me. And so I didn't realize, I thought it was going to be my generation that helped bring in our next, our, the next one. Um, but it, we went back a little bit. So she was able to bring in my, you know, this grandchildren. And that's really how it should be. I realized that our grandparents, our grand, our grandmas, our aunties, we need to incorporate them in that process. Um, that that really should be the way it should be done is our grandmas and our aunties should be catching our babies. Um, so I, I really found like, wow, that was just the way all of this, just the way all of this had to happen. Um, part of my, um, I, my grandma, I'm going to show you some pictures um, of my grandmas from the past. And, you know, there's actually writings about her birthing in the cedar trees and the cedar groves. Um, so I know that some of my grandmas birthed alone. Um, some stories that also stood out, even non-Indigenous stories. I have a practice um, where I see like all different types of people. And this Palestinian woman, she said, you know, my grandma delivered you know, under the fig tree and cut the umbilical cord with a rock and um, then just went on with her day. And I'm like, wow, you know, so it's those stories that really um, inspire me and intrigue me. And I know that that's the healing, you know, when we, you know, give up our power or give up our intuition, um, that's where the trauma begins. So it's really about um, stepping back and, and taken back from that trauma and taking our power back. And it's also about, about healing the multiple um, generations too. So, you know, where my mom delivered us at home, she had all the power and the strength to catch us and be there for me, you know, in, in that moment that I needed her. And so then um, after that, you know, then the midwives that I had called, you know, just to be my backup support network, my sister came 
And uh, my sister um, sang us the songs that she was going to sing during my labor, but I told her not to come. Um, so she came after and she sang, you know, the birthing song and welcome song and honoring that. And um, my uh, Miriam came and my friend and they gathered around and checked me out and checked out the baby for me. And it was nice to have them after to come and be supportive um, and just, you know, make sure everything was good. Um, so that was really nice. I'm really, you know, blessed to be able to have that. Um, I, rec I recognize that it's a bit of a privilege to have access like that and to have, you know, other women willing to step up and come in and help out, you know, only, only when needed too, you know, not to, you know, if needed and when I ask them and, you know, to give me the space, the space to really, you know, do things the way I wanted it to be done. So really grateful for that and grateful for them um, to, to, to recognize my needs and to help me. And so then, you know, I took care of myself too with the sitz baths and healing. Um, and then, and then from there, you know, the ceremonies continued. So, um, I had a spirit, um, the, my, the baby's father does ceremonies and he conducts, um, naming ceremonies. So, um, we had a naming ceremony and she doesn't have an English name. We just, um, neither of my children have English names. And that was part of it too. I didn't want them to have English names. I didn't think it was necessary. And um, so, Wao De Mikanok, Lighten the Heart of the Turtle. And then um, my son is Genabe Noragaki Gamut. So that spirit name is part of the teachings too. That's really important so they know who they are. So they have direction in their life. So they have connection to the spirits. So the spirits know, know who they are. So that spirit naming ceremony is really important for them going forward. Um, and then that dream of that giveaway ceremony, um, I did when she turned one. So she turned one in March and um, I had her giveaway ceremony then, that, that dream that came to me. Um, so I, at her one year birthday, we had a, a nice giveaway ceremony and the, the father was able to um, provide some wild rice from Red Lake and it was really beautiful. So um, those type of things are important to um, give that child foundation um, so they know, they know their clans, they know their names, they know where they're coming from. And that, that's the foundation that they need, you know, for a good life, for a good life going forward, um, knowing their ancestors. And um, when I was doing this, I'm a little bit ashamed because I still haven't done the placenta burial ceremonies. Um, their placentas are, my son's placenta, and he's 10, and my daughter are in the freezer. And um, the, my, the father provided um, birch bark baskets and I know where they're going to go on land, on, um, on my land, my family land, um, on Penobscot territory, um, really sacred land. There's a spring nearby. And so I know it's just hard to get to because it's an island. Our reservations are islands. And so that one doesn't have a um, bridge or anything to it. You can only canoe. So it's hard to get to certain times a year. Um, so that's been the challenge with that ceremony. And I really wanted to open it up to for other women um, so we can bring back these teachings, the berry fast, the rites of passage, um, my, my, you know, these birthing teachings, the placenta, the umbilical cord teachings, um, moss bags, cradle boards, all of these teachings that need to come back um, to, to, my, to the Penobscot people you know, I really wanted to kind of open it up to that placenta burial ceremony because they don't really happen. Um, they're not really happening, I feel like. So um, anyway, that I still need to do that ceremony. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, so this is, you know, basically my personal story of um, reclaiming our birthrights, reclaiming our ability to um, birth, you know, our grandmas to catch the babies, um, using all of our teachings, our ceremonies, so that we have a healthy 
um, body, mind, spirit that goes into um, raising that child going forward. So it's really our grandmothers um, that are guiding us and leading us. So I, I, I can show you a few pictures and I think if I show you a few pictures, it might, um, it might um, help you kind of see a little bit further, just a few pictures. So these are my grandmas. Um, Chimaligla on the left is my grandma from five generations back. She's the one, <laughs> she's the one who's really guiding me. Um, she comes to me a lot in a lot of these teachings. Amarenko on the right. And this is one of my favorite te pictures of Chimaligla, my grandma. Um, she's really at the heart of a lot of why I'm doing the work that I do. And um, she's the one who had her baby in the cedar groves. And I actually wanted to go find those cedar groves um, where she had her baby. It's, it's a written down story. This is my um, feast um, and ceremony that I had in preparation. My grandma, my aunts, my mom. Um, my son was the only uh, male figure there, but he was my fire keeper and um, helped with the tobacco. And then this is my son, that's the partridge berry medicine. So it's not that, um, I wish I had a pointer, it's not the Pipsisua there, there's a Pipsisua in the picture. It's a viney one with berries, the partridge berry. Majile Sawayman um, is how we say it. So really important medicine, um, prepares, for pregnant, prepares for delivery and labor. And uh, that's the medicine I drank um, probably three weeks before my due date and then um, during my labor, I think I had maybe like a, probably had a few couple cups. I think my mom made a, a whole pot of it. So I had it probably, I probably drank the whole pot between um, labor and then after postpartum. So that was really kind of the only medicine besides the red raspberry that I really needed and used. And then the father um, wasn't at my birth. He was in Red Lake. Oh, I don't know if I mentioned that, but he lit the sacred fire. So um, when I went into labor, I called him and I said, it's time to light the fire. And that sacred fire burned for four days. And so that sacred fire burned for four days, lots of tobacco offerings and prayers. And that helps um, guide the baby spirit earth side safely. So that, that fire is like a beacon to help guide that baby spirit. And so that fire burned um, for four days. And I had him light it uh, when I started my labor. And then my personal, my personal pictures, I mean, aren't the most glorious. Um, it was funny too when I, um, after I delivered my baby, I was sitting there with her and I said, mom, I got to deliver my placenta. And I told you my mom had a retained placenta and a hemorrhage with my brother. My brother was like 12 pounds. And so my mom was like, oh, the placenta. And so she runs to get some plastic and a bowl. And, um, but basically I stood up and that, um, when I was ready so I could feel that contraction coming. And I just stood up and placenta came right out. So it's not the most glorious picture, but, um, that's me and the baby um, first making eye contact. And that's um, my mom, my mom who helped me. And my son, my son was there, but he, um, I, I think I was a little bit, a little bit loud. And um, I, ha I was on all my fours and I was yelling into um, a pile of blankets, but he ran and um, took his video game into the bathroom and locked the door. <laughs> And then um, he came out to see the baby, but he came out right before the placenta came. And that placenta really grossed him out and he took off running again, but um, that was funny. And I wanted to say, so with me, you know, I um, like to let the um, babies wean themselves. Um, I find the nurturing, um, there's so many reasons to breastfeed past a year. So a lot of pediatricians will say, you know, breastfeed for a year. Um, are people traditionally breastfed um, well into toddlerhood? 
My son weaned himself right before he was four. So every baby is different how long they're breastfeed for. Um, this was a beautiful moment where I'm able to bring the babies and my children into ceremony um, when they're young and breastfeeding and they're really open and in that spirit realm. So, um, you know, being in that ceremony, listening to the songs, listening to the teachings, um, listening to the rattle and the drum is really powerful. And, um, but she's still breastfeeding. Um, <clears throat> we had an incident in January where they had gotten a really bad um, fever and flu and she stopped breastfeeding for a week and it was really bad. But we stuck with it and she's breastfeeding now perfect and um, a lot, breastfeeding a lot. And um, so we'll just let her wean herself. I think it helps the baby develop, brain development, immune system. So, so many health reasons, but also it's very nurturing, helps them, um, I think, become more independent and helps their behavior, helps them feel comforted. So um, I breastfeed um, for as long as they need. But being in ceremony and having them a part of that at such a young age is also really important. And then this is her moss bag um, with the cloth that was given in a gift. And then that's the bear claw that I beaded that holds the umbilical cord. And then she was able to go into a swing, um, the Cree women, um, had, I was going into a sweat lodge and they were going to babysit for me. And they were like, she needs a swing. And they built her a swing. When I came out of the sweat lodge, I was so happy to see her in the, in a swing. It was really beautiful. Those Cree women are really, um, really amazing. So honored to get teachings from them. Um, so yeah, my child, Wawa De Mekinok in her swing and her moss bag with her umbilical cord, her clan. And that's her in her cradle board that her father made. So all of those important teachings, cradle board teaching, moss bag teachings, so much depth, so much depth into them. And so that's part of being able to raise our future generations, you know, knowing, knowing um, where they come from. I think it's powerful for me to know that my mom carried me in a cradle board and I wanted that for my children as well. So Wooly Winnie, thank you. Um, I, I hope that in sharing my, you know, I don't really like talking about myself. I didn't really talk about my labor or birth too much, but it really, um, hopefully it can help others, you know, help, ho help others know that um, they have choices or, you know, maybe take health, you know, um, health actions in their life if they need to, or um, spiritual connections, or finding um, teachings on birthing. So there's so much depth and so much knowledge. And so I just wanted to share um, my story, maybe help inspire others. Um, but yeah, thanks, Rhonda, for having me. <clears throat> I think if your family... Yeah, I realize, you know, my mom gets a lot of credit because, you know, I, I wouldn't have been able, I wouldn't have been able, I think, to do what I did perhaps hadn't, hadn't I been taught, you know, the strength um, and not to fear, you know, labor. Um, there was, there was absolutely no fear, you know, not even an inkling. It was like, um, you know, the one mo the one fleeting moment of, you know, what do I do to make this feel better? You know, <clears throat> as soon as I, as soon as that fleeting moment was over, it was like, I had to take action and, you know, get this baby out. So I, you know, bared down and threw down on my hands and knees and that just comes. So it's really um, having that ancestral knowledge, your ancestors are there, they're guiding you. So I think it's important to have some kind of um, network, <clears throat> you know, if it's not going to be your own mother or your own family members, you know, I think every woman is different too, you know, and every birth is different. Um, every pregnancy is completely different. So, you know, it's just so, I was so introverted that whole pregnancy that that's just how, you know, I call, you know, please don't come, you know, that was just 
my son's birth was completely different. You know, I had like everybody there. Um, so I think every pregnancy is different. Every birth is different every woman is different. And so it's basically about honoring whatever it is that you need, you know? So if your family is trying to dissuade you or put fear into you, um, you know, maybe acknowledge their concerns and address their concerns. Um, but basically when, especially when it comes to labor, it's really your, your, your moment. And so you really have to honor what your needs are um, your needs come first and foremost. So if it's, if you're not going to get support, you know, perhaps from your own family, perhaps, you know, reaching out to others, maybe trying to educate, um, you know, trying to educate as far as, you know, it's only been in recent times where, you know, women weren't birthing at home. So even in the early, you know, what's it been maybe a hundred years, um, versus thousands of years, you know, we've been doing it at home our way for thousands of years. So um, it's really that colonization, that colonial mindset and that fear that has changed things. So I think, you know, I don't know that I have an answer for you. Maybe Rhonda has. Well, I have some thoughts. Um, I, I think that the main thing is that um, our the birth stories that were before us absolutely impact our births. And I want to just highlight a couple of things that I heard from your story and that I also just felt um, a connection to. And that was um, that, you know, I, I also had a mother who, who not only, you know, believed in birth, but truly loved birth. Um, you know, she, it was, we used to joke that, um, you know, if that's how we would break in our boyfriends was we would bring them for Christmas dinner and it was just birth videos at Christmas. And that's the way life was. And she birthed seven children in very, very different ways and raised many more and was very open about the fact that she loved pregnancy, loved birth, loved breastfeeding and had very different stories with every single one of us and finding her power in that way. And there were some births that were more medical. I mean, for example, she had a placenta previa and that was another aspect that I wanted to just bring up is that, um, you know, I, I grew up hearing these beautiful, beautiful birth stories that made me feel confident and excited to give birth. I, I was excited to give birth. And when I was 16, her, her, my, my last brother was a complete placenta previa and a hemorrhage that I witnessed in an emergency cesarean. And so I had to do my own work, that my own work around, um, you know, that, that aspect that was also given to me of, of fear around bleeding. And so I, I feel like uh, whatever those pieces are that the generations before are bringing in to your story, um, that giving them attention is really important. You know, find out and, and you know, it's something that I, I, you know, you speaking about it beginning at coming of age, it's true that that's when we should be hearing these stories, not when, not when we need those protection around us, but so we can understand um, what are, are the people in our lives and those deep relationships are bringing into the room. Um, and that sometimes it means protection. And sometimes it means that, you know, they're not in our, our space. You know, my mother certainly chose and your mother certainly chose to give birth in a different way than their mothers had. And, and so we're a second generation of that. Um, but for many people, they are, they are the first to make this very different, different choice for their family or in, in a, a, a a generation or two of time and whereas my grandmother you know it was twilight sleep and you know absolutely not feeling or knowing um you know of, of my mother's mother um experiencing that um and so i want to just acknowledge that whatever those elements are um that are brought in that we need to give them give them the attention that serves us and so it might be recognizing that this is hard for this person and they can't be in my space and support me. And so how can they still be honored for who they are and not have that brought into my space? And that's something that in the podcast um, 
the last one with Melissa Byers and Shan, how I, I love how she brought forward of, of how, you know, her mother being able to be a part of her birth stories in ways that felt comfortable was healing for the entire family. And so sometimes we offer that in the space and sometimes, you know, you having your story and then, you know, sharing your ch with your children a, a pathway that can be different is how the generation before us can find that healing. Um, I also just want to share that it's all of those relationships, whether it's the, the, the people that you're inviting into your, the room or partners or um, grandmothers, it's all of those different roles that we need to acknowledge how they, how they impact. And, you know, the fact that you shared that trust um, and that knowledge that she believed in her body and is believing in your body, um, that that is setting the stage for, for you to be able to birth in power. And so choosing who is at your birth, I honestly feel is one of the, the biggest things that we need are, are to have, you know, guidance that goes beyond obligation or tradition or, you know, any of the things that other people feel is important. It has, it has to be guided. Um, it has to be guided by your dream work, by, you know, the, the, the inner knowing that you, that you feel throughout pregnancy and that to trust that. I know it's interesting too. It's our generation that has, it seems like, you know, it's a kind of a lot on our shoulders, <laughs> a lot of responsibility because uh, I'm getting chills because so much was taken. Um, and we have like this, well, I feel anyway, personal responsibility of reclaiming so much for my own children, you know, and birth is such a, a huge, huge foundational part of that reclamation process. So it's like, you know, in our, in my generation, you know, I'm 40 and I feel like it sounds like Rhonda's right here in the, you know, this generation um, where we have, you know, our grandmothers who were that, you know, really, really kind of traumatized, um, you know, uh, mindset. Um, there's a lot, there's a lot of difficulty as far as, you know, access. Um, and I know Rhonda is kind of working on that too, hopefully <laughs> training, training, <laughs> Put all that on you, Rhonda. Training, um, training us, you know, so that we have, you know, more and more skills, you know, uh, to be able to have the comfort to be able to support other women, you know, because I'm not, I, I still need to develop my skills before I have the um, ability to help other women. Um, so I think access, I think finances. You know, but if we're working with other indigenous midwives, you know, developing trade, developing relationships, um, you know, payment plans, you know, I don't, I don't necessarily like insurance models personally as it is. So um, I find insurance models are too dictator, dic, you know, dictatorial and authoritarian. Um, so I personally don't work a lot with insurance models. A lot of my medicine um my medicine is you know not through insurance coverage as it is as far as naturopaths and midwives every, every medicine i ever ever wanted was never insurance covered <laughs> um traditional medicine so yeah i mean trying to find access and finding affordability i, I think those are huge issues that i too might not have answers to i don't know if rhonda can speak to those I have a lot of thoughts, <laughs> a lot of thoughts. And I think that the main thing is that, um, you know, I could talk to days uh, for days about how it's true that um, in a lot of territories, there are not people who are able to freely, safely, without fear of, of consequences to be able to step into the path of, of midwifery uh, for whatever reasons that is um, and that that has to change um, and that this is our our birthright to support one another and it, it the model that we have of um, Indian Health Services and revolving doors of practicing doctors and other people deciding what is is safe or good for us it has never served us. 
Um, and so there's, there's a lot of thoughts on what aspects to participate in within those systems and what aspects just don't belong within them. And, um, and, and that it's complicated, but that uh, what I know is that with the more options and the more awareness and the more people stepping into that medicine, um, the more that people will be able to find what they need and will be able to help each other. And so, so yes, um, you know, training, supporting, mentoring, sponsoring, providing scholarships, legislation, um, you know, it's, there's a lot of different tiers and of, of, of ways to help increase access. Um, but that ultimately it, the first step is about remembering that we deserve it, um, that we deserve to choose where we birth and how we birth and with whom and, and also that what is put at the center. Um, you know, what is put at the center, ourselves and our dreams um, and our, our wishes and our power or institutions and systems and dollars. And so, you know, how people navigate that, that pathway for them, both as, as midwives, as doulas, as, as pregnant people um, is very, very different and very different in different territories. Um, so it is complicated, but yes, it's, it's being discussed and tackled and, um, and connecting people um, is one of the, the big focuses. Um, but like I said, that first choice is remembering that, that we deserve, we deserve um, to have what we dream for. And, you know, you shared in your story how, you know, that, that it, it is, it did take some time, you know, it did take some time and that also the plan that you made in pregnancy looked different potentially than when it was time to make those phone calls. Um, and so, you know, that there's also that, that we just have to trust ourselves, um, that we will, we not only don't need to settle, um, but that we'll know um, what we need and, and be able to ask for it. So I think uh, as far as the placental burial question here, um, I think maybe every nation has different teachings um, on placentas. So I think it's important to kind of try to look into um, your own your own nation and your own um, history of what, what happens there. Um, for me, the placental burial is important to give back to our Mother Earth. So uh, Mother Earth gave me this baby and uh, this placenta, and that will be my offering back to her. But it also, I'm going to put it in the really sacred place that will always connect my children to the land from where they come from. So that's why a placental burial ceremony is important for me. Um, so, but, that that can that can differ for from nation to nation i don't know if rhonda has different ideas I, but. it's definitely something that is different from nation to nation and from from family and their their connection to different land um so it's something that you know as part of the work of pregnancy is preparing um for what what that will look like and also that you know it it is it is very much a part of the a, a connection between between you and your baby and a connection to the land and a connection to territory and also a completion you know that retained placenta I also I, uh, you're hearing your mother and sharing about retained placenta and a hemorrhage um, I also know that that was part of my story for a reason because um, you know I for a lot of complicated reasons um, that I won't get into today, um, that completion of that ceremony um, was challenging for me. And so I held onto that placenta for a time. Um, and, and, and therefore I wasn't ready for that placental burial ceremony yet either. <laughs> and the good news is my daughter was very much old enough to remember and um, to share and participate in that. And so um, I, later I, I realized that it was because um, I actually needed, you know, to, 
to have her share in that. And so it was okay mm -hmm. that I, that I held on. Um, yeah. for that bit of I, time. I think that's part of me too. I'm still, <laughs> still holding on. I cherish every moment of that. And, you know, it'll be nice though when they're together and that they, you know, can be, my son can be a part of that. But yeah, for me, for me, it's important to, to be able to reconnect them to that land and to, to give that back as an offering. And so people are often, if they, you know, people that are away from their home nations, um, you know, that maybe it's, it's that, you know, people choose different things or, or that they, they collect part of um, and, and place part of that placenta or cord in, in the medicine pouch or, um, or that they just choose the, the kind of soil, like maybe it's, maybe that it's buried by a river or, and that you know that all these waters are, are connected to one another. Um, and so some people, you know, don't choose to bury in their home territories either because they can't, um, but the planning around that and the storage around that, there's a lot of stories, you know, is it, you know, a, a pot that was made um, and gifted to you that stored it until it was time, until the ground wasn't frozen anymore, um, you know, all of these things. But what I do know is that just having this sacred connection between you and your baby that was grown just for this pregnancy that, you know, is very much a lifeline that literally rooted your body to grow your child um, and that that is not acknowledged um, spiritually I, I is also a challenge and that it is just discarded with medical waste so often. Um, and so whatever people do with it, whatever traditions they find, whatever feels important to them, um, the simple act of it being a choice um, and putting intention um, maybe it's just a moment of gratitude for that placenta. I've had people that, you know, their placenta needed to go to pathology for whatever reason, um, you know, for, for medical reasons and, you know, where they had, they still just took that moment and, and, you know, reflected on a moment of, uh, gave gratitude um, for the, for the work of that connection. And so there's a lot of people with a lot of thoughts um, and it is very different from nation to nation and also it is one of part of the work of pregnancy is is acknowledging that lifeline and that connection. Talking about um, retained placenta, I did have an herbal formula on hand just in case. And I just wanted to share the herbs because um, I think it's important, you know, I, I use homeopathy too. And so just, you know, at least acknowledging our, our medicines too and to have that first aid available. So I think my, um, Retained placenta formula was um, cramp bark, um, blue cohosh, and I think red raspberry. Um, those are native medicines. A lot of people might use like Arch Angelica, um, which is a European plant, um, but um, cramp bark, blue cohosh, and red raspberry, I think was the formula I had just on hand, just in case, and didn't need it. And I think I um, did take a dose or two after for hemorrhage. Um, and I want to say, um, it was yarrow, uh, maybe shepherd's purse and cinnamon and red raspberry. And I think I just took one dose, um, after the placenta. I actually, when my midwives came, I had a little piece of the placenta actually like hanging out and it was causing a little bit of bleeding and they just kind of pulled it out and I just took a dose of my medicine. But it was good to have, you know, women come afterhand to just check, just check me out and make sure, you know, so that was really nice. But I just wanted to mention um, our medicines um, anyway. So. I also just want to share that you, you prepared those medicines um, and that I think that the, part of those, those preparations were helpful and that that can be very different from nation to nation. You know, some people it's that you're not, um, you know, even, even gathering baby clothes or, you know, that that is, uh, you know, so some of these preparations are very different from person to person um, mm -hmm. and from nation to nation of, in terms of how you get ready. Um, but I just wanted to share that I don't find it an accident that as a young woman, you know, having my mother's placenta, leave her body too early um, and have bleeding in a preterm way with that, that 
obstetric emergency very much um, made sense uh, of why I would want to hold on. Um, oh, wow. Oh, man. So powerful. <laughs> um, so, of course, I held on. Um, right. But it was something that I didn't fully realize um, until afterwards. And so I think acknowledging, you know, all of those those layers and how they uh, people's birth stories and just a reminder again and about that protection is because there are a lot of people who share their stories to people while they're pregnant um, because they have this deep unresolved trauma within them and and so you you absolutely need to protect yourself um, you know from other people's from other people's stories um, only you know follow the ones that are are serving you or impacting you um but it does often mean you know just asking to please you know have positive stories um because we don't need anything that to take root that doesn't need to be there i found it you know that my whole pregnancy too i was really engaged in kind of um finding these stories of women who birthed on their own and that was really what was coming to me that the whole time, you know, finding my grandma's story, you know, the woman I shared from um, her grandma's story. And so I think those positive stories and what you take in really, really matters. Yeah, I mean, um, that's why I'm here to really, you know, act as support as well. You know, I'm a naturopathic physician. And so um, any way that I can help, you know, really, um, love to work with traditional medicines and traditional healing and birthing work. So I'm here as a resource. I think that's really, you know, why I'm doing this is to reach out and to share and to help empower each other with our knowledge. Um, so yeah, yeah, I know Rhonda was just talking about her herbal apprenticeship that she offers. Um, right now I have Wabanaki apprentices. Um, but hopefully there's more work going forward where we can um, work together and there's more training opportunities. Um, especially, you know, me too, wanting to develop my, my um, skills more in depth as well um, for hands-on labor and delivery too. So yeah, we can all work towards those goals. I, I think I'll just add to that 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 in all the ways so um maybe it's as a breastfeeding peer counselor maybe it's you know as the person who sings the songs maybe it is you know that you you make that soup with the traditional foods in it you know maybe it's a person who wants to become a medical doctor um maybe it's uh, a, the childbirth educator or the lactation consultant that basically we need people in all of those roles so you know i do think that just like that bringing back the coming of age that um, also just encouraging our uh, yeah, encouraging people to pursue these pathways. Um, I, I find so many more people are discouraged from entering from from going on this path that they're called for reasons like you mentioned, you know, that, oh, you're up all night. And it's true. I will say the <laughs> the number of nights of sleep that um, I have missed, I are, are not able to be counted. Um, but do I regret that? No, um, <laughs> no, midwifery is, is sacred work and, um, and it's a choice. And that, you know, there's a lot of ways that people make choices on, on how they wanna serve their community or what education they want to pursue or uh, we make, we have a lot of reasons for our choices, but having a calling and having a dream needs to be acknowledged as one that is just as important as a recognized, you know, em employable, whatever. Um, and so I think that in all of the ways and that um, if we just encourage those youth um, to just be involved in support, um, you know, I, I frequently, if people are interested in being a doula or something like that, um, you know, I'm like, just, just go help, you know, just go help clean that new mom's house after she has her baby, you know, just make some foods, you know, just, just help um, be present. And then people will find the parts that they're really passionate about. And some people it'll be birth work and some people will be plant work and some people will really love surgery and, you know, and, and they'll find what it is that 
what it is that they want to do and how they want to offer care to their community. But the main thing is we just need to inc keep encouraging and not discouraging for people to step into that medicine. Oh, well, I did the training. Um, <clears throat> I did the um, certified indigenous breastfeeding counselor training with um, Cami Goldhammer and Kim Salas. Um, I think Cami was a guest on Rhonda's first first podcast and their training is amazing. Um, I'm not sure if they're doing any online. It's like a, it's a full week of training. And I know that they've been traveling around to different communities. So they're definitely the ones to look into for that, for breastfeeding resource. I would suggest, unless Rhonda has any other. Um, well, what I'll just share is that um, to stay tuned that um, there have been several different requests and um, we did begin a National Indigenous Midwifery Alliance and that that will try and help network people to people that they can apprentice with in their communities for um, in particular for midwifery, but then also, um, you know, using the resources that are in your area and just asking. Um, I do a lot of global health work and I can say that I can land on an island and just go to the farmer's market and find the pregnant woman and then ask like, oh, so who's supporting you? And then I find the midwives, you know? Um, and so I, I, I think that um, uh, with a lot of this work, um, you know, it's not something that you hang a sign and advertise and make a website, um, that it is it is community, grassroots, family, nation-centered work. And so um, to really just begin um, by finding out what is in your area and, you know, and then can pursue more information there. I'm here in the Northeast. And so we have a organization here called Eastern Woodlands Rematriation. And um, we've been doing a lot of work together um, with herbal knowledge and food sovereignty and things like that. So if you're in the Northeast, um, you can connect with us. Um, we have Nipmunk, Wabanoag, um, Wabanaki people mainly, um, but anyone living in the Northeast is welcome to join our collective Eastern, I'll write it down, Eastern Woodlands Rematriation. And then I also have specific um, Wabanaki apprentices, um, herbal apprentices, and we're going on year two. Um, we've had a few cancellations and hopefully we're getting together this summer um, for year two, but we are accepting new apprentices to join, even though they'll be late. But that's um, for Wabanaki people. So if you're in the Northeast anyway. And I also shared the Indigenous Birth Workers Network Facebook group. Um, and there's, I, I believe, um, 800 um, different birth workers on that page. And so depending on your area, that might be um, a place to begin and also people post trainings that they're offering or events that they're offering um, and then Cami and also Daybreak Star Doulas and Open Arms Perinatal Services they're doing these amazing lactation lounges and those are free to anyone to sign on and so if you're specifically wanting to just hear from Indigenous breastfeeding counselors that's a, a lovely resource as well. So the Eastern Woodlands Rematriation and the Wabanaki Apprenticeship that is for, yeah, it's indigenous folks. Any closing thoughts or closing prayer before I end this recording? Well, <clears throat> I've, um, now that we're on quarantine, I've been having a um, language, language lessons on Zooms, Zoom language classes, which has been like one of the really positive things with homeschooling my son and uh, we're all able to take language lesson together. Um, three generations of us at home, me, my son and grandma. Um, and then my daughter can listen in. So we, um, three generations of us take in language lessons on Zoom. And um, one of my language teachers, Edward, Edward Purley, you know, he said, 
you know, we're really going to, you really should learn the songs because that's where you'll start to learn the language. If you start with your songs, um, you'll be able to learn the language. So in yesterday's um, class, it was with um, Nua Louie, who was Passamaquoddy, and he was teaching us the children's honor song. And he um, sent us the words. And, you know, I, I heard the song a lot, but he sent, um, he sent the lyrics and the translation. And um, to, sing, to sing the whole song is quite lengthy, but I thought maybe I'll just um, sing a little verse and then just read to you what the translation is. Uh, because I thought, oh, how fitting the children's honor song. So I'm, <laughs> I'm not the greatest of singers, but I thought I'd share um, the children's honor song. I think it'd be a, just says my connection's unstable. Am I okay? All right. Away, oh, hey, oh, hey. Away, oh, hey. Away, oh, hey, way, oh, hey, away, oh, hey, away, oh, hey, way, oh, hey, away, oh, hey, way, oh, hey, away, oh, hey, way, away, away, oh, hey, some sweet chip. Oaken Yali to we a yitskit go nick Naji kulu wohan a wazizak. So, without me totally destroying the song, as I am just learning it, um, Grandfather Eagle that soars over the earth, go and look for the children. Grandfather Eagle that soars over the earth, find the children, these children. Grandfather Eagle that soars over the earth, help the children, these children. Grandfather Eagle that soars over the earth, give the children your medicine. Grandfather Eagle that soars over the earth, teach the children the native traditions. Musumsui chiplokin, yalituwiya yatskitkamik, kekimen skijinue, yaktak wasizak. Teach the children the native traditions. Oh, 